attendeth my way when so This has never happened to me, but I've heard of it happening to others. Maybe it's happened to you. You went into a room, couldn't remember why you got there. 
You've been looking for your car keys. They're in your hand. (laughs) Searching for your glasses. They're on your head. Now, we would never admit that, would we? Certainly not in a public venue like this. We'd want to brush that off and say, oh, no, that was somebody else, not me. We're here to talk this morning, though, about something that the Thessalonians had forgotten. And uh, Paul wants to remind them. For the third time in three chapters, he wants them to be mindful of it because it's, it's something that's easy to be confused about. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you would, turn in your Bibles over there. We're going to take a look at Paul's instructions. He's getting close to the end of his letter to the church that he loves so deeply. And he wants them to be strengthened and comforted by one thought and one thought specifically. Jesus will come back. For the third time in three chapters, he's going to reiterate that. Jesus will come back. If there is one fact that is irrefutable in the New Testament, it's this one. His departure into heaven guaranteed, according to his own word, his return to get us. Let's take a look at what the word of the Lord says. If you brought your Bible, you can find it. If you didn't, it'll come up on the screen. Let's stand together. We read chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we don't need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You're all sons and daughters of the light and sons and daughters of the day. We don't belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like the the others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith, and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are now doing. Pray with me, won't you? As we begin this new year, Lord Jesus, we come to you humbly, recognizing there is one thing that lies yet ahead that we can't account for, your return. We know it's a sure, a sure thing, but Lord, while we wait for it, help us to be mindful. I thank you today, Father God, for your word and the clarity that it brings and the life it offers And Lord, as we launch off into this discussion today, I pray, Lord, that you would encourage us with it, that you would bless us with the thought that you love us so much, so deeply, so passionately, that you're going to keep your promise by coming back to get us. Guide us now, Lord Jesus, in this time. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, If there's one thing we can be sure of, it's what the word of the Lord says in Mark chapter 13, verse 32. If you have your Bible open still, flip over there, because I want you to see something that Jesus says about his own coming. (coughs) Excuse me. He wants to jump ahead of where some people will try to go in figuring out what the return of Jesus, his own return, will be like. They want maybe uh, to set a calendar or a date and establish that and have everyone stirred up 
as a result of it because maybe they know something that the others don't. I want you to see in Mark 13 what Jesus himself says about his own return. All right? It's an important milestone in understanding what Paul's trying to say in 1 Thessalonians 5. Let me read it for you. Jesus speaking, he says, No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So this much we can say with absolute certainty, and this is where we'll begin, that Jesus is coming back. We just don't know when. Now, I did a little research getting ready to come to you today, and the end of the world proclamations, they're abundant. Anybody notice that? I thought, you know, when was the first time somebody said, the world's about to stop? I got to look in and, and, and found a, a website, theend.co. If you're interested, you can go there and find it yourself. Not right now with your smartphones, though. Hang with me, all right? According to theend.co, one of the things that they recognized is that in 634 B.C., the Romans thought the world was going to come to a screeching halt. Half a millennia before the time of Christ, they thought they had it figured out. Jump ahead to the time of Christ, the apostles. When you read through the New Testament, one of the things you'll find over and over and over again is their absolute clear conviction that the return of Christ would happen during their lifetimes. They thought he was coming right back. They didn't think he would be gone as long as he has been. And then let's jump ahead a little further, all the way down to the millennia change in the year 999. When you read through the pages of history, one thing becomes abundantly clear, especially at that epoch, that time period. There were a lot of people saying, this is it. When the calendar flips over to 1,000, see if this sounds familiar, just change the year number. When the calendar flips over to the next millennium, that will be the gate key that Jesus has been waiting for. He will come and deliver us on January 1st, 1,000. Hmm, sound a little familiar? How many of you heard the same thing about the year 2000? Yeah, but basically all of us who are old enough to remember it. We remember it clearly. That, was, that wasn't the next time, though. In 1947, when Israel became its own independent state, there were people coming out of the woodwork saying, this is it, this is the end. That Jesus has been waiting for Israel to be a geopolitical state again, and now it is. So the return of Christ is abundantly close. And then when that didn't happen, again in 1968 with the, the Nine Days War, and then again in 1988 with the publication of a book that maybe you've heard of, maybe you've read about, uh, a book entitled 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988, 26 years ago. He, the, the gentleman, Edgar Wisenut, he wrote this book passionately and deliberately, and if you'd like to see it, I actually have a copy that I've kept for the last 26 years. You're welcome to come see it after the service is over. I'll leave it up here. One of the things that you'll find when you read through this is he puts a lot of reasoning to it, but I want to call your attention back to Mark chapter 13. No one knows the day or the hour. Let's jump ahead to 2000. Man, if I got one more email from a well-intentioned, well-meaning pastor saying the end of the world is coming in January 2000, I was going screaming for the hills. They were coming out of the woodwork. And then again, May 21st, 2011. I don't know why that date was chosen, but man, they spent a lot of money warning people that the judgment was coming that day. And then again, the Mayans in December 2012. Isn't it easy to get confused? Isn't it easy to, begin to get overwhelmed? Or the other danger is to begin to think maybe Jesus really isn't coming. I've heard that a lot, too. Maybe Jesus has forgotten us. Maybe it's further off than we think. I wanted to talk to you today for the first part of our, our time together about what we do know 
that Paul lays out for us, not just here, but throughout the work of the New Testament, what we do know about the return of Christ that would encourage us as we launch off into this new year, all right? So here's what we start with, and here's where we pick up with the notes, the little blue sheet that came in your bulletin today. If you want to follow along, you're welcome to. When you set a destination, you begin with where you want to end. you got to start at the ending point and work your way back. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. He said, here's the end. At the very conclusion, I'm coming back and I'm going to deliver you. All of you will come home to be with me. You can be sure of that. As a friend of mine likes to say, all he lacks is finishing up. But in the meantime, what do we know about the return of Christ? I think there are at least a handful of things we can say with absolute clarity and with absolute certainty. So here they are, in no particular order. The return of Christ will be obvious. That was one of the things that the the Thessalonians were worried about. They were thinking, maybe Jesus came back and we missed it. We were asleep and we didn't realize it. We missed the bus. Would that strike fear into anybody else's heart? Uh, yes! Have you ever shown up late for a church event and there was no one there? And you thought, did Jesus come and I got left behind? I won't say it, who it was. It wasn't me, but I know a pastor who thought he knew what place where a wedding was to take place at that he was supposed to do. He showed up there and no, no, it wasn't there. And they began, he began to believe the rapture had come and he got left. It'll be obvious, church. I want to call your attention back to the end of 1 Thessalonians 4 where he talks about how clear it will be, how obvious there'll be no what was that kind of thinking. Jesus' return will be obvious. There's another thing, though, to it, and I want you to see this one because this one is just as important. It'll be sudden. Notice what he says there in verses 1 and 2. For the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Oh, sudden. That goes with the next thing that I'd like to throw out at you. The return of Jesus will be unexpected. A friend of mine says it this way. Jesus is going to return to an 8 a.m. class. Because the word of the Lord says that He will come when men think not. Some of you will catch up to that later and go, oh, okay. Having taught those 8 a.m. classes, yeah, I can tell you that's for sure. Sudden, unexpected. Notice the analogy that he uses there in those first few verses. Like a pregnant woman struck with labor pains. She didn't know, she didn't plan for it necessarily to be that particular moment. And yet, that is the very moment that God had chosen and given rise to all these other things. It'll be sudden. It'll be unexpected. And here's where it really becomes important to us. If you knew that Jesus was going to return on September 1st, what would you do differently? If you knew Jesus was going to come back tomorrow, what would you do differently? Hopefully the answer is nothing. But let me ask a follow-up to that. If you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, who would you tell? Who would you want to take with you? Who would you want to gather up? See, this is the reason that I'm talking to you about this today. One of the callings that we have that is most dear to my heart is to go, to take the gospel wherever we are might go. Go, Jesus says, and make disciples, baptizing. That's what we're about. That's our mission. But it's for a purpose, and that purpose is to be with Jesus at the end. We're starting with the end and then working our way back. That doesn't mean we have all the answers, but it means that we know this. Jesus is coming, and we want to take as many people as we can with us. It'll be sudden. 
it'll be unexpected. There's another thing that I want to throw out to you. Not only will it be sudden and unexpected, it will begin a new era. In Revelation chapter 20, we see the launch of that era. In Revelation 20, the Bible talks about a 1,000-year reign after the return of Christ, a 1,000-year period where Jesus will rule in a very specific and powerful, authoritative way. A thousand years. Think about that for a second. Our nation is 238 years old. That's not a drop in the bucket compared to the reign Christ has in mind. When he returns, that 238 years of American history goes away. A new era launches, and he is on his way with it. Here's the most important part of it, though. With the return of Christ, it will begin a fellowship for those in Christ with him for all eternity and with each other. We've talked all summer about this, but let me reiterate it. One of the most beautiful things God has done is put together the church. I don't necessarily mean this building, although we're included. I mean a body of believers. While none of us is perfect, we're called to love one another. And the reason for that is quite simple. You're going to spend eternity together. This is practice. And the in fellowship with one another for all eternity, it calls us to some very specific choices. Let's throw a couple of them out right quick, shall we? Offering grace just as freely as we've received it. Ephesians 2 talks about how we've been forgiven. We were broken, we were messed up, we were dead, and Jesus forgave us and brought us back. If Jesus could love us where we were and take dead people and make them alive, then surely we can take those alive people that Jesus has made and love them. Now let's be honest enough to say some people are just about as cuddly as a porcupine. You know some of those people? Maybe you are one of those people. I don't know. We're still called to love. We're still called to forgive. Offer grace just as freely as you have received it. Offer forgiveness as abundantly as you've been forgiven. If you've been forgiven a lot, then you can forgive a lot. And let me tell you, you have been. And lastly, in this portion, offer hospitality even when they don't deserve it. Well, Darren, some people are harder to love than others. It's true. I count myself in that list sometimes. We're still called to do it. And why are we called to do it, church? On whose account? Theirs? No. We're to do it because of Jesus. Let me invite you into that because here's a big thing. I don't love my church just because I love the people I worship with, although that's very true. I love my church because I love Jesus, and he calls me to love him. And even if there are days when I'm mad at him, I still love him. And even on those days when they hurt my feelings, I still love him. And let me tell you, that's something as a shepherd I take very close to my heart, and I want to invite you to it. Don't let small matters grow into big ones. You with me, church? Let me say it again because I want you in, on board with this. Don't let small matters grow into big ones. And if you got an issue with somebody, get it straight. Not because I told you to do so, but because Jesus did. Jesus calls us to love one another, forgiving and offering forgiveness just the way we've been forgiven. We're called to that. Now, I didn't say it was easy, but I said it's worth it. And 
how are we supposed to do that, Aaron? After all, it's difficult. Yeah, it is. That's why he calls us to two things specifically. See verses 6 through 8. He calls us to specific choices. Verse 6, he makes an analogy. So then, let us not be like those others who are asleep. Who are asleep? He's using a euphemism there. He's talking about those outside of Christ who are dead. You got a choice. You can be the alive person God has made you, or you can be dead. Those are your only two options. Let's not be like those who are dead, he says. But instead, let us be, he uses two words here that I want you to notice. Alert, some of your translations say sober, and self-controlled. We have two balance points as believers that we are to operate on. And why are we to operate on that? See it a little more there in verses 7 and 8. This is what it looks like when you're not self-controlled, when you're not alert. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. What happens at night? Things people want to hide. You can operate in the darkness or you can operate in the light. You can't do both. Have you ever noticed how the smallest, teeniest, tiniest bit of light ruins the darkness? You know, in our house, we have a little answer machine. It sits by my side of the bed. My, my beloved son has found that if you push the Bluetooth button on that, that little Bluetooth button will light up blue. It thrills his soul to see that light blue. Here's the challenge to it. Once it's on, I can't turn it back off. And there's no more annoying thing in the universe as God has created it than that little blue light. <laughs> I've threatened to gouge it out. I've cast demons from it. I've called the, the judgment of God to fall on the answering machine. You might say, Darren, you might need to get a grip or unplug it. <laughs> but the reason for that is that little bit of light in a dark room makes a big difference. And where that little bit of light is creates light that the darkness can't overcome. That's what I'm calling you to, church. Be a light where God has made you. He says, you have two jobs, two balance points, and here they are. Be vigilant, be self-controlled. Vigilance, it means being sharp, being alert, being ready, being absolutely confident that you are where God has placed you. And even if you're not absolutely certain on that, that where you are is not a surprise to God. It means letting your mind be in tune with what God is saying. It means filling your heart with his word. It means spending time every day talking to God. Even if you're frustrated, even if you're mad at him, even if you're hurting, you call on him and you say, God, alert me to what time it is. Vigilance. It means being ready. The second one is just as important. Self-discipline. Self-control. It means you say no and you say no to yourself first. That you are willing to set aside the good for now for the better for later. You're willing to, to say, I'm going to be controlled not by others' opinions, but by myself. Here's why I'm calling these two balance points out. Are you ready? Because we live in an intellectually fat, lazy, sloppy society that calls us to shed these two things. Don't worry about being vigilant. Hey, things are going to happen. Don't worry about being self-controlled. Hey! You only live once, right? No. For those of us in Christ, the life that we've started here stretches on into eternity. I'm not ready to settle for just these few years on earth. I want the whole smash. I'm not going to let these few years on earth sully what God has in mind for me for eternity forward. And I don't want you to either. Vigilance and self-control. These are our two balance points. But you know what? We live in such a topsy-turvy world. 
That's why the second thing that I wanted to say to you is this. When you are on the stormy sea, you got to have some balance. When you are living on the stormy sea, you got to have some balance. You know, in 2007, my wife and I decided we would go on a cruise. We decided we wanted to see Alaska. So we got our stuff together and we said, you know what, let's take an Alaskan cruise. I didn't factor in a couple of things. One is, boats are not made for seven foot tall people, all right? <laughs> They're made for people about five foot five, maybe shorter than that. Another thing that I didn't take into account is that food poisoning can be gotten on a boat. And if there's a tall guy on the boat, he's going to get it. <laughs> so the first night of our Alaskan cruise, I got food poisoning. And the boat kept doing this. <laughs> so no matter how much Dramamine I might have taken, it came right back. I would have paid any amount of money to get off. Anybody been there with me? It was amazing how stormy that sea felt. I asked one of the ship stewards the next day, I said, dude, before I barf again, tell me that was a rocky sea last night. No. <laughs> Not terribly. And I looked at him straight away and I said, but it felt like it. That's where vigilance and self-control come in. We live in a society that wants to keep us in upheaval, church. They want you in upheaval. They need for you to stay that way so they can sell you what they want you to buy. But I'm telling you, for those of us in Christ, we're called to two choices, two actions, two steps, vigilance, be ready for the return of Christ. And self-control, say no now so you can say yes later. That's what we're called to. Here's where he ends it up. Starting in verse 8, I want you to see what the Apostle Paul says. Remember why and how you started. But since we belong to the day, he says, since we belong, not if, but since, because this is true, here's what we're to do. Be, since we belong to to the day, let us be self-controlled. There it is again, you see it? Putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a Bible underliner, underline verse 9. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you're doing. Let's start back there in verse 8. I want you to see what he calls us to, how and why we started it is in verse 9. But here's what we're to do as a result of it. Protect your head. Protect your heart. Let's start there. Protect your heart. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Now, he didn't mean it quite the same way we do. He was speaking more physically and physiologically. But I'm telling you today, I believe Jesus has us in mind protecting our hearts with this breastplate of righteousness because that's exactly where Satan will attack first. He'll want you to feel alone. He'll want you to feel isolated. He'll want you to feel cornered. He'll want you to feel pushed aside. So he can manipulate you to the choice he has in mind for you to make instead of the vigilant, self-controlled choice that God has in mind. Protect your heart. How do you do that? By staying in the Word of God. By connecting with Connection Point, one of our Sunday morning Bible studies. By being in worship just like you are right now. By letting the Word of God speak into your life every day. By taking time every day to spend time in prayer saying, God, I want to be that guy you want me to be. I want to be that lady you want me to be. Protect your heart. Second thing, notice that he calls it out, the helmet of salvation. Put it on your head. You remember a few years ago, one of our Dallas Cowboys, Jason Witten, 
caught a pass and got hit so hard his helmet popped right off of his head. But it didn't knock him down. Instead of falling down, or according to the rules that are in existence now, he would have been down, he just kept running. And I thought, you crazy knucklehead. Running without a helmet while everybody else has one. That's a bad idea. And the Lord spoke to me in that moment. Aren't you love it when the Lord speaks through a football game? Amen. <laughs> Some people live their lives that way, Darren. Unprotected heads. They run around and let anybody and anything speak into their eyes and their hearts. They allow themselves to be bombarded. When I was doing computer programming some years ago, we had a principle we called the G-I-G-O principle. g Joe, we called it. Some of you know that program. Garbage in, garbage out. What you put into your head, you can expect to receive back in your actions. We've taught our son a song. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Protect your head. There's a third thing. Remember why, who you're following and why. See verse 9 again, would you? For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Okay, if he didn't appoint us to that, what did he appoint us to? He appointed us to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus called us to himself, and by doing so, that's why we started. And by starting there, we walk together. See the last thing, and with this we'll stop. Rally those around you to do the same. You ever noticed how easy it is to have a mob mentality? Maybe you were a part of that flash mob. I won't ask you to reenact it if you were. That took place in convocation here at, at our gym over at the old Lon Morris campus. Maybe you saw that where all of a sudden people just got up out of the crowd randomly, spontaneously it seemed, and they rushed to the floor and they all joined together in this big flash mob. And it was exciting for those who were present, but I'm warning you against it in some other respects. Don't allow the mob to sweep you up unless they're going the right direction. And how will you know the right direction unless you're vigilant and self-controlled? Make sure you remember why you started. Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 8, 30, verses 34 and 35. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow after me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses it for my sake and the sake of the gospel will keep it. So what would you rather have? a short-term future or a long-term? Because those are the only two choices we have. We can receive Christ and live in light of his return, or we can live in fear of the return of Christ and what it might bring. Now, there will be some who will say, oh, he's been gone so long, he won't come back anytime soon. We don't know that. So it's up to us to be the ones who are taking that good news. And it's not as hard as you think. Start like some of the people did in Atlanta this week. Maybe you read about this. I sure did. In Atlanta, Georgia, at a Starbucks, there was one person who said, you know what? I'm going to pay for the coffee of the person behind me and let them receive a blessing from that. Well, the person behind them was so blessed by that, they said, you know what? Let me pay for the person behind me. And so it went. Are you ready for this? 378 customers. All because somebody started it. 378 customers. What was it like to work the counter that day? Do you think they understood something about grace? It starts small, church, but it has to start. And it starts with the recognition that Jesus is coming back. Pray with me, won't you? Oh, Jesus, thank you that you are coming back. That we can be sure of that. And even on days when it might feel like it's longer than we want it to be and that we're so confused and we're so lost and we're so, it, it hurts so much to be here, we say with confidence and gratitude, thank you, Jesus, that we can say, yes, we know you are coming back. 
May we live in light of that, Lord. I pray for those who are here today, who are listening, whether they be in this house or on the radio or maybe watching us on television, who are saying, okay, I get it, but I'm not, I don't have that confidence that I'll go with Jesus. I pray you would give them the strength to stand up where they are when we do this invitation in just a second and run. Don't walk. Run, Lord. Lead them down here so we can get that right. For some of us, Lord, we've grown cold to it. It's no big deal anymore. Yeah, we've got our, our ticket stamped, but it's no big deal. Build a fire of passion within us that calls us to action that having our ticket stamped isn't enough. We've got to find others who don't. I pray, Father, that you would do a work in us as a church that helps us be vigilant, be self-controlled, and be passionate about making sure people know Jesus is coming back. Speak into our lives right here and right now, Lord. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Perhaps the Lord has spoken to you about making a decision. Here's your chance. Maybe you need to come down here and commit your life to Christ for the first time. Meet me right here. Maybe you're looking for a church home. Join us here together as we serve the Lord. Maybe you need to come to this altar and spend some time talking to the Lord. Here's your chance right here and right now. Stand with me, won't you?